our second panel, which is entitled Perspectives on Cultural Production Post-2003. I'm really delighted and honored to moderate this panel. My introduction is going to be very short to give time for uh, these four wonderful folks who have agreed to be on this panel to talk about. Um, all four of them are Iraqis uh, who are makers of culture or scholars of culture who will talk about their perspectives on um, the aspects of uh, post-2003 cultural production in relation to Iraq and what has happened in Iraq. Hanan Jassim Hamas received her PhD in literary theory and comparative literature from University Autonoma de Barcelona. I'm a Real Madrid fan, so I have problems pronouncing uh, Barcelona. <laughs> her doctoral thesis entitled The Body Sign, Contemporary Iraqi Fiction and the War on Terror examines the semiotic and conceptual influences that the war on terrorism had on the representation of corporeality, sexuality, and gender in the narratives of Iraqi and American authors since the US-led invasion of Iraq. Her research interests involve body and violence studies within the context of military subjugation and cultural colonialism. She's an adjunct lecturer of literary theory and comparative literature at UAB, where she also coordinates the master's degree in contemporary Arabic studies, a member of the research product Genders, Languages in Contemporary Arabness, and a former member of the editorial council of Revista Banipal, Spanish edition of Banipal magazine. Please welcome Hanan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hanan, uh, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you, Georgetown, for the invitation. Uh, as we say in Arabic, assalamu alaikum, peace upon you, uh, to all the organizers, assistants, and participants. I'm deeply grateful and flattered to be asked to speak uh, about perspectives on Iraq's cultural production for 2003 on such an important and commemorative occasion. And uh, to be with such a group of creative personalities, which I very much admire. Now, I don't think I can fit everything I want to say in 12 minutes, so my intervention is going to consist of general remarks and uh, leaving details for the discussion. Uh, these remarks are sectioned in three parts. So the first entails my statement regarding the perspectives on cultural production. And in the second and third parts, uh, I'm going to justify my statement in terms of what's there, what I can see in Iraq's cultural production. And then, of course, we are focusing mainly on literature. I'm a literary scholar, and literature is, uh, is what I can speak about. Then in the last section, I will make some uh, theoretical reflections. So to outline my statement, there is no way for me to begin without quoting a line my mother used to say. Uh, my mother is an Iraqi journalist and an activist. She was the director and the founder of the Occupation Watch Center. And in her uh, US tours and public talks against the occupation, she used to say, it is not enough uh, to demand peace in Iraq, but it is also important to fight for justice. And over the past 20 years, that, that, that sentence shaped the way I examine and think about Iraq's cultural production. In the light of that idea, I argue that we need to be very careful in determining the perspective from which we look at any literary and any artistic production in context of coercion. And by careful here, I mean constructively critical. It is not enough to give visibility to Iraq's cultural production, and it is not enough to make that a quota that would confirm our diversity and awareness uh, of the damage done, and as that has limited uh, the reading and the dissemination of Iraqi literature as an object of a study wrongly named and classified as war literature. Uh, it is also very important to do justice towards the post-2003 creativity. Um, and that is done when we honor this literary and artistic production by examining it as such. That is, by assessing its aesthetic value and its creative capacity to relate and respond to the great concerns of modernity and human thought. Uh, so it is not only, Iraqi literature is not only a record of pain and trauma, uh, it is not only an infinite narrative of collateral damage to quote the title of Sinan's novel, but it is also a testament to the will to be and to a sovereignty threatened under becoming a bare life and under uh, a bare life under the savagery of neo-colonial militarism. And above all, it is a testament to life and creativity. Uh, so as far as literature is concerned, this testament to life and creativity 
translates into abundance in literary writing, and particularly in the narrative genre. According to the uh, research of the late scholar Najm Abdullah Kazim, and also uh, the Iraqi author and literary editor Samuel Shamoun, between the years 2003 and the year 2018, there have been more than 700 published fictional works in Iraq. A number, the Shamoun says, that surpasses uh, the ones published in Iraq throughout the entire 20th century. And I would like us to uh, think about that for a minute. And let us not be fooled thinking that this flourishing in literary creativity is a fruit of imported democracy or freedom of speech or prosperity. The tendency towards writing fiction is a shift in the medium that conveys poetical language. Thus, uh, scholar Haytham Bahura shows poetry and short stories have been the predominant genre in Iraq's expressivity. However, Bahura argues, and I hear a uh, quote, in the face of unimaginable violence and in the collapse of state institutions, fiction has played an important role in narrating the unfold experiences of Iraqis during years of war, occupation, and civil conflict. This burden of representation placed on literature uh, is particularly crit critical in post-2003 Iraq, which has witnessed the dissolution of a coherent nation, uh, nation national space and a constricted public sphere. The novel intervenes in this context to narrate the intensity of horror of, uh, of war and its impact on the individual, who has often served in literature as a metaphor of a broken nation. Now, in addition to that, I argue that storytelling has been and still is a major concern of postmodernity. The novel's polyphonic, polyphonic uh, capacity of containing and articulating discourse may, makes it the recourse of exposing the complex reality of contemporary subjects. And to show, of course, incredulity towards the meta narrative imposed by both uh, the, the, the national uh, regime and also the colonial, neo colonial and orientalist uh, discourse of the war and uh, in favor of the war and invasion of Iraq. Um, so in, in, in this sense, what, what used to be yesterday's poets are today's filmmakers, rappers, novelists, visual artists, and also critics. And naturally, this tendency towards fiction, towards storytelling as a medium of poetic language brings around a new fictional, uh, new fictional subgenre. So uh, we can talk about the first anthology of science fiction in the Arab world, Iraq Plus 100, an anthology of science fiction edited by Hassan Blasim, imagining Iraq after 100 years after the invasion in 2003. Curiously enough, this anthology was followed by Palestine plus 100, imagining Palestine after 100 years from the Nekba of 1948, which shows that at least for the editors and the publisher of these anthologies, the impact of the, imp of the invasion of Iraq is comparable to that of the Nekba. Now, of course, these are not the first attempts of writing science fiction in Arabic, but they, they are, this is, these are the first sci-fi anthologies to receive, to receive international recognition, translations, and awards. In addition to science fiction, there is also the so-called fantastic fiction, defined by the scholar David Boas as the genre that presents an aesthetic alteration in narrative logic and the problematization and a questioning of the notions of reality. Tanan Antoun, Hassan Blasim, Ahmed Saadawi, Ziyad Jubaili, Abdel Hadi Saadoun, among many others, are known to write in this genre. There is also the first anthology of noir fiction, uh, which, uh, which was presented as part of Akashic Books noir series, Baghdad Noir. Uh, it came after Beirut Noir, Marrakesh Noir, and Tehran Noir, whose editor, the Persian author Saral Abdu, uh, is also one of the author in, uh, authors in Baghdad Noir. Uh, and another author in that anthology is the American author and the U.S. veteran who served in Baghdad between the years 2003 and 2006, Roy Scranton. There is also the Tunisian uh, author Hayat Reis, and together with many Iraqi authors. And this plural perspective in narrating the city shows how Baghdad is part of the consciousness of its neighbors, visitors, and invaders. Um, all authors of, these, of this anthology have lived in Iraq for a period of time, and it shows uh, how Baghdad in these works uh, is the locus of a semiotic cultural dialogue. Professor Haytham Bahura also talks about uh, the genre he termed the post-colonial Gothic, uh, 
And he defined it as a literary genre expressly concerned with the questions of history and the return to the repressed through dark narrative that staged spectacles of horror through the use of the supernatural, the uncanny, and the monsters. End of quote. Now, other, uh, other than this glorification in, in, in new genres, and of course they are new within the context of Iraqi literature, uh, there is also an increased interest in translating awarding post-2003 Iraqi fiction. And I'm not going to go through those uh, awarded and translated words, but I want to highlight this interest in promoting post-2003 Iraqi fiction, because this is where we need to be careful. Clearly, the question that the genre proposes and uh, uh, expresses a need, uh, or it shows a need to express uh, the predicament of the population under prolonged suffering. And this attention in promoting that particular literature of this particular period of time shows an act of solidarity with a traumatized people. But, and this is where my last uh, third and last section began, uh, what we are dealing here, uh, what we are dealing with here is a materialization of real people, real people suffering into a cultural product subject to market demands, expert evaluation, interrogation, and examination. And the question rises here, uh, what is being valued here? The aesthetic equality or the intensity of the suffering? Or on one hand, sometimes this cultural product is a cultural luxury that serves as uh, serves the narcissistic gaze. And then on the other hand, this lead author, this leads authors and consumers into a banalization of violence and suffering. Literature and art that assumes the ambitious task of showing the world the suffering and the violence uh, of wars and catastrophes relies heavily on a discourse of pathos, which is unfortunately has become important for work to be selected and promoted in film festivals, book fairs, rather than to be critically addressed to question uh, for questions of hegemony and resilience. The excess of information on the suffering of others and the mass of production and the promotion of such narrative does not alleviate the victim pain, pain, victim's pain, however. And the reality on the ground shows that it does not stop the violence or amend the victim's circumstances. It is something that has been also spotted by uh, the poet Sargon Falls uh, in his poem, The Corpse, and in the commentary which uh, Silan Antoun has on, on that poem. Uh, he says, Anton says, and, and I quote, the poem reminds us of the challenge and the difficulty of attempting to speak for and on behalf of the victim's torture. And to that I add, they, uh, I mean, it reminds us also of the evil in promoting the suffering of others in the format of a cultural product. The only thing that the focus on suffering can do is to ease the viewer's or the reader's moral consciousness through the act of sympathizing with the pain of others, distancing them from the victim, yet giving the viewer and the reader a sense of authority and moral satisfaction of being aware of the other's feeling. And of course, being aware of that pain without living it. The consumption of such narratives grants the viewer full experience, that of watching, of feeling, of knowing, and of judging. It gives them an entitlement to speak of the victim's victimization, to do something about it, to intervene, to help, and to save. And of course, these are the classic cliches of modern colonial chauvinism. Um, it should be very clear, however, and, and these are my final remarks, uh, that I, I am by no means suggesting that it is immoral to write about violence and suffering. What I'm pointing at here is the need to work on instruments of rep representations that wouldn't limit the Iraqi self to being a suffering site, but rather to emphasize its ontological status as an outspoken subject. Criticism and a scholarship should look deeper and wider to avoid falling into the banalization of violence and suffering. So for instance, what we need to think about is um, uh, how the invasion of Iraq is, uh, is represented in other literatures, like the Spanish or the Italian, who also participated in the military operations in Iraq. Or maybe we can think of the, or think of the links of the experience of the invasion of Iraq with other experiences of, of coercion and hegemony, such as the Vietnamese or more recently the Ukrainian. 
Another debatable aspect in contemporary Iraqi li literature is the relative absence of the invading soldiers or the absence of the invasion from Iraqi narrative. While the Iraqi character is present in the very many veterans writing as a source of trauma and terror, or as a justification of war and invasion, most Iraqi uh, authors refrain from engaging with the invading soldier as a character. I can name only very few works where the invading army and institution are central, or at least at the background of the narrative. And I have a couple of reasons for, um, for this phenomenon, but I will keep that for the discussion. Now, what I left out uh, is mentioning the feminist discourse in contemporary Iraqi literature, which requires at least another event like this one to be able to be, to, to be discussed thoroughly. But I want to finish with one clear point, that despite everything, I'm optimistic. And I believe that the protests in 2019 brought about a sense of revolutionary discomfort. And it showed that Iraqis, or at least Iraq's younger generation, refused to be framed within this narratives of victimization. And I'm sure that this has made at least some authors to think twice, if not many times, before making any aesthetic decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hanan. Our next speaker is uh, Loki, Kareem Dennis, AKA Loki, is a British Iraqi hip hop artist, academic and political campaigner. He's a patron of Stop the War Coalition, Palestine Solidarity Campaign, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, and the Peace and Justice Project, founded by Jeremy Corbyn. He also sits on the board of advisors for Declassified UK, a website that investigates the British Ministry of Defense and Intelligence Services. He has spoken and performed on platforms from the Oxford Union to the Royal Albert Hall and Glastonbury. And I should add, he's a great artist and rapper. You should follow his work, and he's very active on social media, and you should follow his Twitter account. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sinan. Uh, what I would like to start with is the uh, wider push of what I'm going to say is going to critically analyze the way the United States attempted to establish an infrastructure in Iraq, which was about the psychological and even cultural manipulation and engineering of the society for particular um, aims. When we look at the British documents from the revolution in 1920, we see the panic that British civil servants were in about the work of Mohammed Mehdi al-Basir, the blind poet in Iraq um, condemning the British occupation. You look at reports of Mohammed Bahr al-Uloom and his work as the people's poet and the, uh, the worry that that caused in British administrators. Of course, the work of someone like Aziz Ali and dealing with the technological advancements and the way that that could be integrated into a fight against colonialism in his piece, The Radio, where he says, as long as the radio is able to expose secrets and damage colonialism, then long live the radio. Of course, Muhammad Mahdi al-Jawahari, when we look at his poem for his brother Ja'far, after he was killed in the uprising against the uh, Portsmouth Treaty that the Iraqi government signed with the British, in which 400 protesters were killed, and among them, one of them was his brother. He really lays out, I would say, a skeletal structure of what we're going to look at of what the United States tried to apply to Iraq <clears throat> in terms of perception management. He says, you went out and composed thousands of articles the state destroyed our homes and suppressed our writers, and the rotten Thamesians who grip hold of the soul of this nation are treated as dear lovers and close relatives. For these tyrants bestow their bliss upon the white man while leaving the poor brown one confined in the stable. For I am their death, bringing their houses down upon them and inciting even the doorman and the baby to curse their names. And really, this is a description of the power of culture in particular moments full of tension between occupier 
and occupied. And there's another side to the cultural impact of 2003. Amin Cesar uh, lays it out with his concept of the colonial boomerang effect, which is whereby you saw organizations, for example, that were set up to manage the war on terror, like Palantir, um, a data organization that essentially now has come back to have contracts in places like Britain, uh, managing data of the health service. Even Khaki International, this was a company implicated in torture of Ghraib, went on to deliver the census for Scotland. And then you see in US culture, the manifestation of the Iraq war with things like computer games, uh, six days in Fallujah, about placing the game player in the position of a US soldier and being part of that horrendous campaign, which started with the occupation of a primary school and ended with the, the use of white phosphorus and depleted uranium. And then the naming of a US warship after Fallujah, again, the imprint on US culture of the war in Iraq. And Chomsky has made the point that the toxic legacy and cancer rates in Fallujah are actually worse than Hiroshima. Hiroshima saw a 17-fold increase in leukemia, but in Fallujah, they have found a 38-fold increase in leukemia. In fact, from Madonna to Lady Gaga to Rihanna, you have seen musicians in the United States use the aesthetics of the, of the occupation of Iraq for music videos. And there's even a more interesting, I would argue, messy and complex and complex solidarity expressed by residents of Myattsfield Council Estate in Brixton, who renamed their community Baghdad as a kind of way to articulate the type of uh, targeting by state violence they felt themselves to be. And then you have the area of Chicago, where young men there are actually three times more likely to be shot dead than US occupying soldiers in Iraq, nicknaming their area Chirac after Iraq. All of these are interesting cultural formations. But the lens through which culture is absorbed today is very different from a Jawahari's time, for sure. You have 98% of the Iraqi population owning television, 88% of them owning radio. In terms of internet users, 70% of the internet users are between the age of 15 and 34, with 40% of them overall being under 24. Now, 87% of the uh, people in the country absorb their information by watching daily news. Only 47% of them absorb their information by listening to the radio, and 28% only are able to understand the world through reading uh, newspapers. Now, what the United States did at the beginning of the occupation was broadcast onto Iraqi TV from Commando Solo, which was a fleet of converted transport planes that were broadcasting these radio shows and TV shows. This was under the watch of General Tommy R. Franks, the head of the US Central Command. And this led to the foundation of the Iraqi media network. Now, this was a great outsourcing, no bid contract delivered to the company Science Applications International. And what you saw was the forming of um, several key um, ways of communicating information in Iraqi society. Of course, this company, Science Applications International Corporation, at one point had the board member, Robert Gates, who was an ex-CIA director. And of course, the contract came directly from the Defense Department. We also know that the company had a joint venture with Bechtel, a construction company that also gained massively from post-occupation uh, no bid contracts. And when you look at one of the channels established in al you're talking about 41% of Iraqis considering it to be an important news source and 72% watching it weekly. Another one, Al Sabah newspaper, was established by this um, arrangement. And while this was being carried out, it was under the control of the Special Operations and Low Intense. Intensity Conflicts Unit, which is a uh, Defense Department um, uh, division which handles psychological operations. In addition to that, you see Radio Sawa and Al Hurra, which are directly funded by the US Broadcasting Board of Governors. And of course, 
This is al Hurra, for example, is 25% of Iraqis consider it to be the most important news source that they cover, and 55% of the population, I believe, to watch it weekly. And this is what could be defined as soft power and an attempt to form the culture of a society. What we also see is the big three companies that gained off the psychological operations contracts that became um, available in the first few years of the occupation. One of them, as I mentioned, was Science Applications International Corporation. Another one is um, Lincoln Group, which uh, was actually led by a, a British man from Surrey, which established something called Iraq X, which was focused on the um, creation of strategic public relations and an outreach to target audiences. And this was hundreds of millions of dollars that these companies were awarded. And the focus of this company, the Lincoln Group, was to alter Iraqis' perceptions of the coalition forces. And this was headed and directed by the Information Operation Task Force in Baghdad and was led by the Lieutenant General John R. Vines. Now, these interesting psychological operations have come, come under a little bit more scrutiny now, with particularly the Lincoln Group being identified as planting fake news stories in Iraqi media. The Lincoln Group claimed to have connections to 300 Iraqi journalists across the country. And what was even found is that the Lincoln Group had been paying religious scholars in return for assistance with propaganda services. Now, another of the big three is Cy Coleman, which was um, also part of the psychological operations. It was a subsidiary of L3 Communications at that time. And what has now happened is that L3 Communications transitioned into L3 Technologies, which is today an arms company that brings in tens of billions of dollars per year. We know that the British were also attempting their own psychological operations in the South when they began their occupation by distributing 10,000 copy, copies of El Zaman newspaper named after the Times in England, which is, of course, well known for its connections with British intelligence services. And the interesting thing about what the occupation did was it established an unregulated space with an unclear social contract. Um, and the unregulated space really allowed for um, the, the blossoming economically of particular companies based in Virginia, Virginia in the United States and other places that led to um, a transfer of wealth in different directions. But what the United States actually also attempted to do was establish simultaneous to that a strongly re uh, regulated environment both culturally and in a media sense. So what you saw was the CPA as early as June 2003 issuing guidelines for all media outlets in the country and forbidding them from what they would uh, term as incitement against the occupation authority. And you even saw US soldiers raiding the offices of newspapers that were deemed to be in breach of those regulations so much for democracy. Now, another part of this attempt to uh, essentially engineer the society is uh, what the those in US power circles refer to as cultural diplomacy. So you have a, a, an organization called American Voices, which actually launched Iraq's first hip hop academy in 2007. Now, American Voices is, of course, funded by the US embassy in Iraq. And this was supposed to bring cross-cultural cross engage, engagement to countries in transition. And according to a spokesman for the organization, Ashley Bright, she said it was a way to, on one hand, change the perception of the US and American culture in that country, and on the other hand, create an inroad for a different type of diplomacy, a cultural diplomacy. And what that led to was in 2013, the first hip hop dance crew, First uh, Step Iraq, going on tour in the United States. I am not casting any aspersions about people that work for these organizations or have been part of any of these projects. It is a, uh, it's the, the, the need for outlets that creates this uh, ability to warp art. You know, what we're talking about is the warping 
of art here. When an embassy like the US embassy, which is engaged in the occupation of a country, is funding the art, um, there has to be a way in which you can critically engage with that and see the power dynamic as having an effect on the art that will be created. And I only actually know about this hip hop project because I was actually mentioned in the article as a rapper that identifies as Iraqi. So hence, I was um, somehow uh, uh, in, in, uh, initiated into this process. My, my existence was used as somewhat an argument to justify these kind of US um, projects. And then what you've also seen is the US Embassy, through American Voices, run another um, event for five different Iraqi orchestras. And again, this was engaging with 300 of the country's aspiring performers and was um, uh, promoted as a cross-cultural educational experience, which was um, completely positive. Now, the question has to be asked in all of this is these are merely skimming the surface of the type of cultural uh, projects that have been um, established since the occupation. And the question has to be is what are the consequences of these types of um, these types of initiatives? Now, I was someone that at one point was asked by the British Council um, to accompany them to Iraq, and I refused this because you know the British Council is the cultural propaganda body of the British government. It was established that way. It is previously included on its own websites, BP and BA systems, as clients of. It's an exa another interesting example of what we are talking about with this uh, this cultural engineering was um, I put out a song in 2019 in solidarity with the uh, protesters who were facing serious repression. Now, following the release of that song, I was approached by an individual that worked for an Iraqi NGO who told me that they were working with the British Ministry of Defense. And they thought that because of my work, I would be a, a good person to help them implement a program online, um, a, an initiative online, that would aim at targeting uh, Iraqi political figures based in Britain and actually stripping them of their British citizenship. Now, by my estimation, that would be not a good thing to do. And I made clear to the person that I have absolutely nothing positive to say about the British Ministry of Defense, and I absolutely would not be involved in this bastardization of my art. And it has taken place, unfortunately, on an industrial scale throughout these imperial endeavors. I feel one major push of the media in this country has been to re-portray um, imperialism as noble intentioned incompetence. And I think that that is quite a harmful notion for people to absorb and, and take into the way they understand these things. We have, of course, a popular talk show, which is all the rage and viewed by millions across Iraq. But the script writer of the show in English is someone by the name of Elizabeth Siegel, who previously worked for Madeleine Albright. Now, I'm not using that to discredit the talk show, but I do believe it should be taken into account when understanding the information being communicated by that important show. You also have a show that was popular here once upon a time in Iraq. It was co-written by an employee of Chatham House. Now, Chatham House is also funded by BAE Systems, Lockheed Martin, and the US State Department. These are relevant to the conversation about cultural production. So I guess in my parting message to Georgetown, which itself is an integral part of the US war machine, particularly through departments like the Walsh School of Foreign Service, which was at one time funded by the CIA, that despite the best ever efforts of the United States to shape Iraqi cultural production, understanding it as a key part of the battle for hegemony, it's not a story of flawless, interrupted power, and people continue to assert their independence and resist 
<clears throat> Thank you, Karim, so much for that rich presentation. Our next speaker is not a stranger to Georgetown. Uh, she graduated from the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, even though she didn't put that in her bio. And I'm proud to say that she was at a, at a point uh, my advisee when she finished an MA at the Gallatin School at New York University. Um, Regine Sahakian uses writing, teaching, and art making to examine critically the relationship of contemporary art and culture to coalition wars in Iraq. She founded SADA, an arts education initiative for Baghdad-based students, operating from 2010 to 2015 in Baghdad. Sakian curated Iraq, Reframe, the Montalvo Art Center, Sajjad Abbas and Laith, Dair City Limits at VCU Qatar, and Shangri-La Imagine Cities, Los Angeles Cultural Affairs. She has taught at California Institute of the Arts and published in Warscapes, Eflux Journal, N Plus One, Hyperallergic, Camera Austria, The Derivative, the Beirut Art Center, and Art Forum. Recently, Sakian created an anthology film with members of SADA for Documenta 15. Please welcome Regine. Thank you so much. Um, Sinan and for the invitation. I actually didn't graduate from Georgetown because um, as the war seemed that it was starting, I dropped out of the graduate program. There was just too much excitement around the war beginning. Um, so I didn't complete uh, the master's degree there, um, but I was very happy to go to NYU and to be able to work with you um, on, on my studies there. Uh, I, I, I appreciate very much um, uh, the comments prior and um, illustrating so many of the issues that are uh, sort of endless and can be very overwhelming to think about, um, as are things like the anniversary of the invasion. Um, I think the anniversary is a very difficult thing to think about, as there's the one-year anniversary, 5, 10, 15. Um, and here at 20. And so I, I, I want to sort of start at 2003 um, initially and the aftermath of that war and how I have learned the things that I have learned, which I continue to learn from so many of the artists um, who were very young when the invasion began, um, artists that I've worked with in depth and um, whose work continues to shed so much light on what has um, taken place and also has enabled a kind of space to to look at and examine what has taken place through their own experiences and putting together of all of these different conditions and contexts that they have been having to face and having to, to work through. Um, when I first went to Baghdad, uh, it was 2010. Uh, went as an individual. I had gone many times before with my family to visit um, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, in 2010, I went as an adult to look at starting SEDA, which I wanted to first talk to people, um, artists who were working there to see if it was useful or not. Um, and when I arrived, we were landing and at the airport, which is near Alpha Palace, I saw this this thing that looked like a blimp in the air. Uh, and I landed and I was asking my cousin who had picked me up, what is this blimp in the air? What is it doing? It was this really strange, huge object in the sky. Um, and he, he sort of laughed and said, it's the Americans, they're taking pictures of us. And it was one of these um, aerostat balloons that had been placed uh, all over Iraq, actually, but particularly around the capital. Um, and this was above al Fa Palace, which actually is now the American University of Baghdad. So there was this uh, interesting interplay of landing, which on the plane were so many military and contractors and um, people going into the city for their reasons. And also this recognition from the residents of the city that they were being watched and surveyed, not only from the checkpoints that were all over, um, not only from army and military going into their homes in the middle of the night, but also from the sky. And everyone was aware of this. And it, I think this is one of the ways that we 
have maybe forgotten sometimes how much um, people who are living in the cities and the Rockies have been in the crosshairs, literally in the crosshairs on the ground from the air for so many years um, and so many days and not necessarily had an opportunity or the space to be able to work through that or to work from that position um, because of the difficulty of being in that position for such an extended period of time. Um, and so I think when we talk about when we talk about cultural production, um, there is this there is this enormous amount of production that has taken place that we still haven't worked through or really know the scale of. Um, you know, you touched on the amount of you know companies that have so much data and how we see the cultural production of Iraq, which is literally in everything that we touch and do. You know, the scale of the technology that was taken from Iraqis through biometrics, through fingerprinting, through all of the ways that Iraq served as a kind of data center and prison center, even if people weren't necessarily drilled, although so many people were, you know, all, all of that has fed into the culture that we all live in now and the kind of technical advances that we are living with every day um, and that sort of surround us constantly. And so we, we have Iraq in everything that we do, whether we realize it or not, and that's not only for Iraqis, although of, of course, they need to be centered in any kind of conversation around this kind of production. Um, I also think it's important to understand what was happening globally in arts at the time in this space after 2003. So the enormous amount of money and capital that was uh, injected into the global economy after in the invasion of Iraq also enabled this enormous kind of uh, push for contemporary art of the Middle East, which became a huge market after 2003. And um, we see this particularly in the Gulf states, which became very sort of infamous for these massive, you know, star architect built museums, uh, cultural centers, extremely funded initiatives, uh, this idea that they were opening up to the world and mainly done through this engine of contemporary art. Which of course, which is you know also an incredible vehicle for finance and for money laundering, um, and also for public relations and and psychological operations. Uh, so you have this enormous amount of cultural production also being utilized in the Gulf states and used in the Gulf states, which uh, had a major economic um, participation in the invasion um, alongside strategic partnerships. Um, and and was able to become a platform for uh, content creation and the proliferation of this idea of contemporary art of the Middle East. Uh, so you have the first, in 2007, you have the first ever auction of contemporary art from the Middle East uh, with Christie's and Sotheby's opening in Dubai. Um, and then onward you have, you know, the sort of museums that are established in Qatar and other parts of the UAE um, and uh, in the last few years, much more publicly Saudi Arabia, um, which also uh, alongside this held these massive, started to sign and hold these from the 90s and onwards, these enormous military partnership agreements uh, for the United States to wage their wars in Iraq, but also through the war on terror in Afghanistan as well, Syria, Libya, Yemen um, also. Uh, so there is this kind of hand, hand in hand work of military and cultural production um, on a on a on a scale that maybe is even unprecedented, you know, with what with the kind of money and building that took place in, in the region. Um, as that's happening, uh, Iraq obviously is undergoing the, the occupation and uh, the constriction of opportunities that I have seen, I feel is much more compounded as the years went on. Um, and so as someone who works in the art, the art sphere, um, I was constantly being asked questions about, you know, where, where are the Iraqi artists? Why aren't we seeing Iraqi artists? Where are they? Why aren't they represented? What are they working on? Um, and all of this really shed light on the fact that no one understood what was happening in the country. There was still this 
there remains this serious lack of understanding of what it takes to produce artwork, uh, how what artists were facing in the country, and the kind of isolation that people who were living there were were um, were beset with. So, you know, for for those who are sort of outside the contemporary art field, there's an, an enormous amount that's required to make a living as an artist. Um, isolation is probably one of the biggest hindrances to being able to make a life as an artist because you are not able to be mobile with an Iraqi passport. You are not necessarily able to travel to exhibitions for people to come and see your work, to be able to circulate um, or to access you know, mentors, people to critique your work, a kind of practice, a serious um, program to be involved in, um, and, you know, one of the most basic things, funding and patrons. Obviously, there are many problems with all of that, but if we're talking on a very basic scale of how to make a life as an artist, there are, there are a lot of um, resources that go into this and a lot of infrastructure that's necessary. And Iraq did have those infrastructures previously. So, you know, the art school at the University of Baghdad, the Institute of Arts, these are free. That is something that's really important to understand, I think, about Iraq in particular, because it means that it is not only the wealthy who have access to art and art school and art making. And the tradition of art making and literature and music and just the incredibly rich cultural life that you see in any city in Iraq or the area of Iraq is very much threaded, I think, in the kind of arts education, maybe not a formal arts education, but in all of the informal ways that are, you know, I would argue equally as rich. So while the art schools are full, um, the impact of the 90s sanctions and the invasion had a had a very um, weakened the capacity of the art schools to an enormous degree. So one of the libraries was firebombed. Many theses were lost in that. Um, the huge uh, drain of people that took place of professors and artists who were now outside of the country and not going back. Um, and the fact that all of these artists were also living in a space where exhibitions weren't taking place anymore. So out of 90 galleries that used to operate, there were two that were remaining. Um, and so, and now, and I would say in the years after, the people who are collecting art or funding art are, you know, a lot of the kinds of actors you would imagine. People who were involved in major contracts, in the war, in very corrupt banking and government systems. So there is not a lot of space for artists to be able to create and make and show work. A lot of that is changing. Um, I think that it seems that many artists are taking it upon themselves to create spaces for their work. Uh, but for many, many years, you would see the same kinds of articles coming out, I think, in international newspapers. I, I think every, every year or so, there's an article about the renaissance of art making in the capital and that artists are finding their way. And it's oftentimes used as a sort of feel-good story about the war and about Iraq, whether it was um, artists painting murals on the blast walls um, in the city, or whether it's the same two galleries that are always interviewed about holding exhibitions again. Um, but I would also argue that this is a very short-sighted way to look at progress or to look at support for artists. Um, there is a there is an enormous amount of rich work and material that artists are working with. Uh, and I, I think that some of the art, art that has come out displays the, um, the very strong kind of work that is possible and that is being undertaken by many of those artists. Um, but the way that that art is also being used uh, needs to be critiqued as well. So for example, um, of several major exhibitions that have happened outside of Iraq, um, we can look at uh, three in particular. One is at, uh, was at the Islamic Museum in Doha, Qatar, where uh, there was a large exhibition on Baghdad that was to coincide with the World Cup. So apart from the human rights abuses of the World Cup, which is their own conference, um, there is an exhibition to go along with it 
which was on the storied city of Baghdad and its relationship to the Gulf states. I was asked personally to write an essay for the catalog about the people of the people of Baghdad or the people of after the after the occupation. Um, I told them that I wouldn't be able to write something on that for an exhibition taking place in Qatar unless I touched on the fact that Qatar is the was the central command station for all of the U.S. military to fight the wars in Iraq, which obviously had the impact on the people that I was supposed to write about. Um, I was told that that was not the nature of the exhibition or the kind of occasion for it, because people were there to celebrate the World Cup, to feel good, and to see the relationship of Baghdad to the, these, these kinds of cities in the Gulf. And I think what was really telling about that, I knew that, that I had a feeling that would be the answer. Um, but what was very interesting about that conversation was that in this exhibition, they were making a correlation between Baghdad as a city and Silicon Valley. So saying that the Baghdad of, you know, of um, when Baghdad was first being established, it was attracting talent from all over the region, participating in innovation, and you know, really starting to flourish in arts and cultural and technology, and that that was how we might know Silicon Valley now. There are actually, as we've mentioned, all of these ties between technology and Iraq, but that is not one of them. You know, the Silicon Valley is not what Baghdad was thousands of years ago. Um, so there is there is this interesting kind of use of Iraq. Um, we also saw a kind of instrumentalization of Iraq at MoMA PS1 um, and their exhibition, which was Theater of Operations, the Iraq Wars. Uh, and it was from 1991 to 2011 was their uh, time period. And this was a major exhibition um, at the museum in New York. I did write an essay for that. And um, when we arrived at the museum uh, to discuss some of the issues with the leadership at the museum, we, because MoMA PS1, we found out the head of the board, uh, Leon Black, major um, hedge fund owner of a company owned and acquired Constellus, uh, which owns, which acquired the company formerly known as Blackwater, and now known as Academy, um, and a number of other mercenary groups. So they were in operation at the time of the exhibition, this was November of 2019, they were in operation in Baghdad and actively rec recruiting from all over the world for uh, mercenary, for soldiers, particularly former military to do work in Iraq and elsewhere, it's an international group. So uh, two artists, um, two young Iraqi artists that were involved in the show, Ali Eyal and Ali Yas, were, um, wanted to protest this along with several other people, most people who were involved in the exhibition, myself included, uh, Janan Al-Ani um, and others. Um, and so the artist Janan Al-Ani. And so, we spoke to the curators about this, the fact that he was on the board, uh, and we were basically told that this was not an issue, that this board member was not involved so much in MoMA PS1, just at the MoMA. Um, and it became very clear that uh, they are, I mean, of course, MoMA and MoMA PS1 are very entrenched. They're one organization. They share the same website. And his son is on the board of PS1, Leon Black's son. Anyhow, this um, show, which was, um, again, a major show on the last day of its closing, Ali Yas, an artist who uh, left Iraq as a refugee and is currently based in Berlin, organized a protest with members of the New School in New York from Berlin, where he was based. And the idea was on the last day of the show that the protesters would come in who had observers, legal observers with them, to tear replicas of his work in protest. And Ali would say a few words from um, and be sort of uh, present in the space over the over a, digitally. On that morning, his work was removed by the museum because they understood that there would be a protest at the museum. And when the protesters came in, the NYPD was called to the museum. Uh, so Ali was basically 
his work was taken down on the last day without his consent. The museum said that it was in danger and under threat of violence, and that the protesters were threatening violence. And those who were at the museum talked about NYPD cars surrounding the museum and police throughout the levels. So what we saw there was a kind of insistence on allowing Leon Black and his owners basically you know, major contributions to the museum, any protests around that to be silenced. And for the artists in the show who were protesting, who were artists who were directly impacted by the invasion, to be criminalized and silenced, attempted to be silenced. So it was very, it was very much an act of homeland security, the kind of policing of Alias, even as he did the protest from Berlin. So you can see the kind of um, sort of authority that was used to bring in and try to crush any kind of protests around the exhibition. Leon Black did eventually step down, but he was forced to step down because it became uh, public that he had a connection to Jeffrey Epstein. Um, so this, the problems with Leon Black weren't that he was in charge, or wasn't that he had ownership of military committing violence in Iraq and elsewhere, but that he had had a relationship to, you know, a pedophile. Obviously, both are incredibly wrong, but it was very, um, it shows something, It I think it very much demonstrates the lack of care or, or seriousness with which violence in Iraq is, is met with. I would also note that at MoMA, they had a whole exhibition on protests within the museum. So protest is something that they supposedly celebrate, that they encourage, that is very much done. Um, but when it came to Iraq and the young artists there questioning the authority of the museum and of its leadership, that was there was no tolerance for that. Um, and then the final uh, exhibition that was the most recent uh, was the Berlin Biennale, where Three young artists, Laith Karim, uh, Ra'ad Mutar, and Sajjad Abbas, whose works are very much uh, connected to Iraq, connected to the events that they underwent as young artists living and working there, um, and that are very political, were put in context and in relationship to um, uh, an artwork um, by an older French artist, which is basically enormous blown up images from Abu Ghraib. Uh, when we protested that work being put in relation, um, we were basically told that we were using identity politics and that uh, there was too much of an emotional connection that we had to Iraq to be able to see clearly uh, that there was no issue with this and that showing these images was very important. Um, I have to sort of uh, point out that these were Nothing additional was done to these images than what we have seen. They were just large, life-size, blown-up images of Iraqi men, the, the pictures that we know of being raped, tortured, uh, murdered, who were corpses um, in life-size, and juxtaposed with the Iraqi artist's work without any of our consent or knowledge. I would also note that this was a massive biennale with many, many artists who work uh, on on different notions of politics and their artwork. And it was only when we saw those images in juxtaposition with the work that there was a protest and that there was any kind of crit critique of it, as well as reviews of the Berlinale. There were a number of people who noted there was an uncomfortable piece, but no one that said, this is not acceptable, or this should be taken down, or why are images of torture being used as an artwork and authored by um, by an artist in this way. So there is still remains, a, um, I think, a, a not just in the United States um, or even in UK, you know, these main leaders of the, of the coalition, but also um, internationally, a real lack of recognition of uh, Iraqi agency, the rights of Iraqis, and the sense that they will, there will be protests and there will be organizing um, around these kinds of issues and how uh, how they are and aren't um, sort of honored or recognized. And then I just want to end with um, something that Sarah Manoff, who's 
a young artist, was a young artist that I worked with. She's now um, living in Turkey. Uh, she had to leave when um, Daesh was encroaching uh, into Iraq. Um, and I just, I just want to say something that she said because she speaks to something that I heard very, very often. Um, and I think because none of us are in Iraq right now, it's important to hear her words. Um, she says, for my generation, it wasn't a hard year or two. All the years were hard. When I was little, it was the Iran-Iraq war, then the first Gulf War. I remember wanting to go to the University of Art during the time of sanctions and thinking about how much it costs to ride the bus. Then in 2003, it became even harder. There was so much killing. I had a classmate who played the guitar. When the Americans first came, the soldiers thought he was carrying a gun and they shot him. That was my first memory from that school. So I knew we were all targets and we might all die at any moment. The problems got bigger and bigger. 2006, 2007, so much killing. No film can carry how bad it was, nothing can. You'd wake up in the morning and go outside and see bodies on the street. Those who lived before us only lived with a dictator. They didn't see the death the way we did. I don't know if anyone has. Every week I would see at least two or three dead. Neighbors, others dead. If you see that every week, how do you make art? Then by the time I finished my master's degree, all the corruption and the Islamic State. At one point, the university closed because they said we were going to be targets because we were artists. If you live all of this, I don't think you can make art or really live. So we all wanted to leave. Thank you, Regine. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you. I don't think we can unfortunately have uh, Mohanad join us, but maybe he'll try to jump in for the Q&A. But the floor is now open for any questions. Um, there is a mic uh, that can be brought, so please raise your hands um, if you have any questions for the three panelists. So, yes, Rochelle. Hi, Rochelle Davis. I'm a professor here. I was on the previous panel. Um, I just wanted to ask Hanan to, um, she invited a question, and you said um, there's a real absence of invading forces, of the U.S. invading forces um, in Iraqi literature post-2003, and you said it in the question and answer. You may be able to explain why. So I wanted to ask if you would, if you would elaborate. Thank you, everyone, for a fantastic panel. This was really, really amazing. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, I believe that there are two reasons. One of them, uh, two reasons why the the American soldier is missing uh, from from contemporary Iraqi writing. Uh, the first one. Uh, it, it feels like there is that the contemporary writing is still processing uh, the, the 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 30 years of dictatorship, and they're still talking about uh, the the horrors that Iraqi people uh, had to go through uh, under um, the Ba'athist regime. That's on that's the first reason. The second reason, I believe that they don't want to make, a, you know, a, a political state. They are shy of making political statement regarding the invasion, because as and this is something that has been uh, said before, uh, many uh, authors are writing to be translated, and they are looking for uh, uh, American and. Um, Spanish and British uh, readership, and they don't want to offend uh, certain uh, political uh, viewpoints, and that's why they, are, they they prefer not to. You know, they prefer to focus on the suffering Iraqi subject without making um, any remarks uh, regarding um, regarding where the suffering comes from. And then there is the third point, which. Um, which Sinan mentioned before, is that there, there, there were actually people who truly believed, and, and, and authors and intellectuals, the whole class of intellectuals, who actually believed that the American invasion was that sort of a liberation and freedom, and that's why they couldn't uh, sort of contradict that viewpoint. 
And there is a, third, a fourth possibility in which that probably we haven't still processed, because not only that uh, the American soldier is missing from literature, but certain uh, big issues, traumas, are also relatively missing from uh, from contemporary like fiction. Abu Ghraib, for instance, although it's present in certain poems, and, and there is actually only one Iraqi novel that deals with the torture in prison, uh, and, and it does not deal with the prison of Abu Ghraib, it's, uh, it's called uh, The Madman from, from Buka. And it refers to the prison in Camp Buka. So, uh, Many of these issues are still not being processed in literature. So perhaps, I don't know, it's been 20 years now, and, and as, uh, uh, as um, Murat in, in Ajam would say, we are still there, here and there at the same time. So probably we still need time to process that, mm -hmm. but there is also a political uh, um, purpose behind it. Thank you. Uh, if, is the question for Loki because he has to leave? Okay, go ahead. Perfect. Um, uh, Sadri, uh, previous panel, also um, thank you for just a, an absolutely phenomenal um, collection of thoughts. Uh, I'm going to be a cheater and ask two questions. Uh, first one to Loki. Uh, I'll fumble through it, but to what extent do you receive queries and questions from uh, artists who are inspired by your work and are trying to navigate political compromise? Uh, the, you know, you've touched on a, a number of them through your talk of the, basically the kind of constraints that you have of the ways where funding comes from to, um, to produce uh, art. And so, you know, how do you, how do you navigate those compromises? Uh, and I'm asking it in the form of how do you, how do you give that advice to, to up and coming uh, artists um, as they're trying to, you know, squeak out some money here or there, or opportunities here or there, just to get their work out there. The second question is to Regine. Hi, Regine. Great to see you. Uh, wonderful, amazing uh, work. You identified three shows at the end that are in completely different settings. Doha, Berlin, New York. And each show had a different uh, political issue. Right. Uh, the first one had to do with the government, essentially. Uh, Berlin, Doha, Berlin had to do with Iraqi bodies and brown bodies and the way they're portrayed. Uh, and in New York, it was about corporate money. So uh, the question I have is, to what extent do you see, as much as these are kind of three different issues, uh, how, where you see the kind of the commonalities across the three when it comes to the treatment of, of Iraqi art, and if there's been any more fallout from the Berlin uh, petition that you uh, wonderfully put together, you and your colleagues put together, any more, you know, that kind of half-assed apology that you got from the organizers, has there been more, uh, you know, fallout from that or recognition that they were just kind of utterly in the wrong or it's, it's uh, blinders? Thank you again for this wonderful, wonderful panel. Um, thank you. I uh, will deal with the question uh, first. Uh, thank you very much, Omar, for your kind words and the very interesting question. Um, I do think it is a balancing act. I've also been fortunate in uh, several important ways. One of them is that I was able to release music at a time where algorithmically the internet was not so ideologically slanted. Amazing. And what I mean by that is 2008 to 2016, you really had the space for things to organically grow. Now, with something called Project Owl, which was implemented by Google in 2017, what you saw was particularly anti-war sources of news and information and art also. Um, receive a kind of uh, algorithmic discrimination. Um, supposedly, it was to deal with the problem of fake news. But again, while it may tap and indicate right, it often smashes left. And so what that has given us is a situation where if your music is not being made by or, or owned by any of the big three, which is Universal, Sony, and Warner Music, all of them have had different kind of interesting relationships with uh, the war machine at different points of history, um, and in some case, shared ownership between particular um, organizations. And that means that the, the, the parameters of artistic possibility, and they say, and I always felt that art was like al-mustahil, <laughs> and, and we were able to really express these things that through politics, um, 
there's just a, a glass ceiling that certain things can't be um, achieved. You know, for instance, again, it's, it's, it's not widely known, but I was fortunate enough in 2009, before my music became more explicitly p political, to receive a, uh, performers, a performing arts grant from the BBC. Now, of course, that's not something that the BBC um, admits to now really publicly or something that would ever be um, received well in the right-wing news in this country, but it did happen. So some of that uh, earlier music was basically funded by the BBC at that time. Um, and, and so I was very fortunate, but that was the last year that that performing um, arts uh, grant uh, existed and it definitely would not be the same. Now, just several years after receiving it, for example, I was at the last minute canceled from an appearance on the BBC, um, as I was told by a BBC employee, because it was September 11th, as if that was a reason that I shouldn't come on because it's September 11th and the worry that something controversial may be said or, you know. And, and so in a way, it's kind of like the, uh, Sinan uh, likes to call it the barbarians in Rome. Mm -hmm. I think that the, uh, those who are associated with the war on terror within the metropoles of uh, these imperial projects kind of became an extension of what was happening in those, those reaches of imperial power. And, and, and a lot of our dealing with the public sector became wrapped up in uh, that kind of stuff. But of course, that is uh, another story for another day. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, so sorry that I have to run. I would love to hear the uh, contributions which follow. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Regine? Um, yeah, th uh, Omar, thank you for your question. Uh, I, I would say that the commonality between the three uh, is that what the, what the wars did for so long seems to have made it appropriate, seeming, or permissible to continue the exploitation of Iraqis and the history of Iraq, the politics of Iraq, the artists, and even the um, and even the political events that have happened, as grotesque as Abu Ghraib was, um, even that wasn't off limits. I think it demonstrates, these three demonstrate that uh, issues that would not be permissible in these major museums are permissible because they deal with Iraq. And that is something that I think all, all, you know, needs to be addressed, uh, needs to be addressed because uh, there is further organizing that's necessary to sort of work through some of that and to, and to sort of fight against it or put pressure when it happens. Um, it was actually very amazing to see how many people signed the letter once it became open. And one thing that came out of it, I think, is, is that it is not that there are many people who recognize uh, the issues with exploiting Abu Ghraib in the way that it was done through this work and through this project. Uh, and there were very interesting interventions, particularly by black writers and critics, who, who have, for many, historically parallel and, and even more obviously more extensive reasons, understand what it means for, understand how, uh, uh, how many issues are involved with consuming uh, bodies this way, consuming a kind of politics this way, and uh, and with institutional critique, which is which is very 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 important, um, and I think it's something that Iraqis haven't had to deal with, haven't dealt with so um, overtly because for a long time this just there there was a hesitation to involve Iraq in shows as a kind of uh, organizing idea. And when they, when there was a decision to do that, we see the problems that arise within it because it is still not seen as a accurate kind of historic his, history and a historic event that needs to be treated as such. So there is a kind of way of excusing it through curatorial subjectivity and an idea that it's you know this is what's permissible by the curators or the artists, and so it's sort of can make it okay. 
Um, but there is a real event underneath this. For MoMA PS1, theater of operations, these are real historic events that have to be considered and explored in a responsible way, particularly if you have profiteers from those wars that are funding the museum it's being held at. Um, same with Doha and with the Berlin Biennale. Obviously, Abu Ghraib was a very real event that you then there are, the, you have to grapple with some of the issues around an artist using those images and then put, attaching themselves as an author to them. And I should add that none of the living um, individuals that were present in those Abu Ghraib photographs that were exhibited in Berlin were notified of the fact that they were going to be used this way. This show, that show and work was also shown in Geneva you know, previously and in Paris. I didn't realize that until I saw them in Berlin, but I think it is very, um, it also demonstrates to us how little this is seen as something that is shared. It's so, so little this concern is shared by other, by, by major audiences who are seeing this work and that we are the, we, we the artists in the show were the ones who then saw it and had to you know, take some sort of action around it. Um, but I think the hope is that the more that we become aware of this and that, that, other, that others will also begin to recognize that this is, not, this is not fodder for, this is not material or fodder for individual artist authorship um, without permission of the victims or for those people who were victims of torture, victims of sexual, sexual assault, or the families who um, are dealing with the murder, murders of their loved ones. Thank you, Regine. Any other questions from the audience? <clears throat> Is there one? Or I, if not, I was going to ask and Hanan if she could elaborate on what, you know, in your research you talk about the, the banality of, of evil and violence and maybe in connection with that, the, since this is kind of the theme of all three presentations in a way, the, the political economy of, of basically cultural or extraction of, of cultural texts from Iraq and Iraqis. So what, what types of narratives and what types of Iraqs are privileged for global consumption in the in the in the global north and what types and how do some writers internalize and unconsciously reproduce certain narratives that they think are more translatable and publishable what types of iraqs are they reproducing um i uh a friend, a friend of mine invented a term of the wound literature, and it's the literature that, that, that speaks of this uh, um, crisis that a nation goes through. Uh, so the Iraq that are translatable are, or the one, Susan Sontag mentioned something in her article about Abu Ghraib regarding the torture of others, is that the only incident that anyone would identify Iraq with would be the incident of Abu Ghraib. And, and I, I, I get the feeling that the only incident that any Iraqi author would be translated or awarded for would be the Iraqi, the author who would focus on that Iraqi suffering, on that Iraqi annihilated body, annihilated subject. And, 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 and that's, that, that's on one hand. And on the other hand, there is this recurrent use of, of uh, images that focus on violence and, and, and the, the, the annihilation of body. So these are the, the scenes that um, depict the Iraqi suffering, which is, which is true, which is real, but at the same time, they deprive the Iraqi subject from its voice. They, it is a defeated subject. And I think that we need to focus on the other kind of narratives. They are the narratives that uh, restore that voice to, uh, to the Iraqi subject and not focus on it as a site of suffering. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions? I don't, let me see if we have any questions from the online, some of the questions for Loki, but um, he's no longer on the screen. I don't think we have uh, Mohanad. Uh, 
with us. I should say just on, on behalf of Muhannad, although I'm uh, claiming to speak on behalf of another Iraqi, but it, uh, some of the problematics that came through in, in this panel really is, is the, the demands of the global networks and how, and this issue that Loki brought up, which is how a lot of these texts are co-written by non-Iraqis, and you can tell right away. And I must say that uh, Muhammad's film in a way tries because there were questions to Loki, and the question that comes up is how then do, and I think a question extends beyond Iraq, how do writers and makers of culture and artists navigate this very complicated network and not compromise their work when obviously there are all of these demands and it's so difficult and there are certain constraints and subject positions that allow some to enter more than others. And his film really um, manages, I think, uh, to strike a balance between um, giving voice to Iraqi subjects and not avoiding violence, but also showing the effects of the occupation. I just, I mean, what came through is, Frank, sadly, I have to quote Fouad Ajami, but in his description of, of the invasion of Iraq, he said the acquisition of Iraq. But in so many of, of the details and the statistics we hear, it's, it's about this corporate extractivism, really if you think of it. And then there is so much talk about we lost the war in this country, but there are reports out there about how so many of the folks who called for the war actually are benefiting and reaping benefits through their connections with all of these corporations. But the issue of the internalization of colonial and mentality and colonized minds which Loki showed how it's actually very organized, is that uh, on social media, a lot of Iraqi writers and journalists, until 10 years ago, were insisting on using the term tahrir. If you go back to Facebook, you'll see that there are debates telling people, you know, the, how can you call it tahrir? So there's all this terminology, or they would call it taghir, just change also. This also takes out who actually effectuated this change. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, um, but I want to end on a, on a positive note to, uh, to, you know, to what both Hanan and, uh, and Regine brought up, and also Loki about the, the Iraqi writers and artists who are navigating this minefield in a way. And I think actually in the, the 2019 uprising uh, really showed the, the talent and the resourcefulness of Iraqis inside Iraq, whether in terms of the artwork and the graffiti, but also the songs and the chants and, and that they were, of course, going back to a longer, very rich tradition of modern Iraqi history and the revolutionary tradition that goes back, as Loki mentioned, to the early 20s and through the 50s. Um, and so I just want to, on behalf of the audience and everyone, I want to thank uh, Loki and Mohanad and Regine and Hanan Regine, I'm sorry about the faux pas. I, my, my, I wrote a novel about a character that has uh, dementia, and I think I got infected from the from the character. So, so. My, but thank you so much. And if any of you have questions and comments, whether here or or online, I think both of them are reachable. Uh, now you're going to hate me for flooding your inboxes. But thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> And I want to thank Coco, of course, and the technical team because they had to navigate all kinds of complexities for this. But I think now it's time for, for lunch. Sorry we can't send you electronic uh, meals. <laughs>